15. Now, I have not taken every verse of this little book. If you want a verse-by-verse -verse sermonic exegesis, we have 20 messages available in our tape ministry from the book of Jude. I preach that many times from the book of Jude to my local church. And uh, they are sermonic in uh, emphasis. Verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Jude wrote in this little book all about the apostasy, the backsliding, the falling away, and the turning from the faith. And uh, he puts in a little breath of fresh air right here in verses 14 and 15. It seemed like he had stood it as long as he could stand it, talking about ungodly folks and folks that had backslidden and folks that were turning from God and folks that were giving up the faith. And it seems like the Holy Ghost allowed him to just open a little window and let a breath of fresh air in here in verses 14 and 15. And you feel it rise up in Jude as the Holy Ghost anoints him. Watch verse 15. You can just feel the animosity at the devil and ungodly folks. And you can feel the shout of praise over what God's going to do in the future. Watch verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Can't you just feel it coming out of him? He's simply saying, ungodly folks, get ready. <laughs> Praise God, get ready. There's a new day coming. And uh, you know, I would be a sad Christian this morning, but I've read the last chapter. I I I've, uh, I've read the last part of the book. And uh, I've had a confirmation that no matter how rough the battle gets between here and there, it's going to work out all right. Did you hear what I said? And that makes what I'm going through now seem but for a moment. And I got that Paul spirit when I looked down at the end of the road. He said, for the afflictions and the persecutions and the privations and the things we have to endure now are but a light thing, a very little thing compared to that wonderful and exceeding glorious day that's coming and what the saints of God will enjoy. And I want you to understand, if you get your eyes on what's happening to you now from the devil and his crowd, you'll get the mully grubs and the blues. But if you'll lift your eyes up to the Word of God and to the hope of God's saints, you'll feel like picking up your chin off of your lap and walking on a few days, weary pilgrim. My blessed God, I'm not living for today or tomorrow. I'm living for eternity, and that's going to straighten it all out. Oh, hallelujah. Whoa, yes. Somebody in this congregation has said in the last few days, I don't think I can stand it another week. Let me give you the magic formula. Let me give you the formula that can make you able to stand it. <laughs> Paul said, Lord, three times I've asked you. I'm having a rough time with this messenger of Satan. I'm having a rough time with this buffeting. And the God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Remember the 14 years ago, whether in the body or out, I don't know, but he saw something. <laughs> Praise God. And he said, I count these things down here as nothing. <laughs> Looking forward to that blessed hope. Praise God. That's the formula for success, weary pilgrim. If your knees are sagging and your chin's on your lap, lift up your eyes this morning. Just a few more days. This could be the day. This could be the moment. And praise God, I don't want my chin on my lap when that trumpet sounds. I want my head up looking for His blessed appearing. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you believe the rapture is going to take place? <laughs> Satan is depicted in three portraits in the Scripture. 
He's depicted in Genesis 3, 8 as a subtle serpent, charming, alluring, enticing. He's, a, he's depicted in 2 Corinthians 11 and 14 as an angel of light. And in the original Greek, this in, infers false religious profession or doctrine. 1 Peter 5, 8, he's depicted as a roaring lion. And these three pictures of Satan in the Scriptures point up his characteristics. He'll come to you charming, alluring, subtle, and so clever with his little trinkets and charm you into doing what he wants you to. But if you're not going to be charmed by his deception and you say, I'm going to get religion anyway, then he'll come as an angel of light and say, you can have religion and that too. You don't have to go down to the church of God and get that old time straight laced religion. Why, you can have religion and what you want to do too. Why, you know what he said in the last days? Why, you can have the Holy Spirit and smoke your stogies, look like Jezebel and act like Ahab. I don't believe it. God may have done some things on a credit to some folks in confidence they'd straighten up, but if they don't straighten up, the Holy Spirit will leave them. Amen? Praise God. Uh, uh, and may I say this? I didn't mean to do this this morning, Rex Taylor. I had that sugar they gave me up here, and I was going to be sweet. But let me tell you one thing. We're having the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Lutheran, and the Catholics receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And God's blessing them. And I've had some of my folks say, Hey, did you know she's doing so and so? I said, Yes, I know it. But God's given her a little credit. Given her a few days for me to tell her what to do. And you to tell her what to do in a good loving spirit. Now God may be patient a few days with some of those folks. But he won't be patient with some of you folks that have been around here 30 years and know better. Amen. He'll give them a margin of grace so they can find where they are and get established. And if they don't, he'll withdraw his spirit. Amen? <laughs> oh, Jesus, you helped me this morning. But he'll come with his little deception. And then if you don't take that false profession and that false doctrine, the roaring lion will show up. And this means violent opposition. Gobble you up. You know, I was reared on Church of God pews well a pallet under the front seat. How many know what a pallet is? I saw one out here last night, and thank God that they's still not gone. But I was reared on a pallet under the front seat, and they'd shout and not wake me up. The only time I woke up was when a hypocrite shouted right by me, and my daddy thought he'd stepped on my hand, and my dad wasn't a Christian. He got up to whip him, and my mother had to quit shouting and help my dad. You see, this, this fellow was the kind of fellow to get up in the church and say, I praise God I don't have a dime in this church, but I can shout. I'm not telling you something out of a book. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, uh, there was an evangelist there that told me, said, Oh, brother, John Doe said he's really getting with me in this revival. And I got that mean spirit that I got from some of you Alabama fellas. I didn't have it till I came over here. Uh, and I said, has he gotten there the first night before you received the offering? He said, I hadn't noticed, but he has been late every night. I said, but he shouted after the offering plate passed, didn't he? He said, yeah. <laughs> and I took the wind out of that fella's sails. I guess that's mean of me, but man... God's not going to let you shout free many times. You've got to pay for your shout. I wish y'all wouldn't do that to me. I said, you've got to pay for your shout. If you don't pay your tithes, you have no right to shout. Sit down. In fact, the windows of heaven are hooked to your pocketbook. Yeah, the windows of heaven are hooked to your pocketbook. He said, if you will pay your tithes and your offerings and open your pocketbook, 
I will open the windows of heaven. You close up your pocketbook and I'll close up the windows of heaven. Aren't they hooked to your pocketbook? How many got the windows of heaven open this morning? Your pocketbook's open. Praise God. Oh, yeah. Blessed be God. Amen. Oh, I feel him. But they'll come around with this false doctrine and then the roaring lion will come. And I got, you know, got under conviction real good. And I got miserable. Why, the Lord uh, uh, got to dealing with my heart. And I'd been charmed by the trinkets of the devil and been following him. And then I said, oh, this won't work. I've got to get religion. And did you know the Lord knows my heart? And I was sincere. But the devil, some of his system, may have been Luke himself. I don't know. But some of them had this girl to say to me. Said, now, why don't you go to my church on Sunday night? Our pastor has an arrangement with a drive-in movie that he'll start church at 7 and get through at 8 and the movie's not going to start till 8.15 and you, if you've just got to go to church we can go there and then get to the movie that angel of light said you can have religion oh yeah you can go to church and I, I did a time or two but oh God that didn't get rid of that lump in my heart did you hear what I said? I still, when I laid my head down on my pillow at night, I felt like I was going to drop into hell. And mom knows this. Mom and dad are here this morning. And uh, she knows this. And dad knows it. I got miserable and mean and wretched. And I tried that false doctrine for a while. But then, you know, I said, my God, I'm going to the church of God. Drive in, movie or no movie. Young people or no young people, I'm gone. And I went to an altar when Lovell Carey preached on hell and it got hot back there where I was sitting and I gave my heart to God. And you see, the charming serpent had come and he had me for a while and then the angel of light, a compromise situation, had me for a while. But when I got old time religion, he didn't come as a charming serpent. He didn't come as an angel of light. Man, he bared his fangs and roared at me. You see, I went to school and I told the coach, I said, I won't be dressing out anymore. He said, you'll fail. He said, you'll... Now, I'm not preaching. I'm testifying. He said, you'll fail. I said, well, I, I won't dress out. I'll play. And I went to my pastor, and my pastor said, Burrow Sumner wrote him a little letter and said, Walter will participate in everything you ask him to do in sports, but he will not be dressing out. He'll wear his blue jeans and his sweatshirt. And the coach said, all right. Then came the dancing time. And, man, I was a hog about square dancing. Lord, how I love that better than a hog love slop. I guarantee you, and that's loving something. And it came square dancing time. I said, I won't be dancing this time. He said, you will or you'll fail. So I went back to the pastor, and he wrote me a little note. He said, we don't believe in dancing, and we stand with Walter. And I sat on the side, and he made me go. And I sat right there, and they danced. And the girls would come by and say, what's wrong with you this year? We couldn't get away from you last year. What's wrong with you this year? And I said, well, I love God this year. Loved you last year, loved God this year. Amen? And do you know what? I made straight A's in that phys ed course. The roaring lion said you're going to fail, but the grace of God helped me get a straight A. But I didn't sit on the sideline with a sanctimonious, holier-than-thou attitude. I got out there and played ball just like the rest of them. And I didn't say, bless God, I'm better than you are, I'm church of God. No, I just sat down with my Christian testimony. And when they'd come by and say, what's wrong with you, I'd tell them. You understand? God doesn't bless a cranky, holier-than-thou, haughty, arrogant attitude. That's not a testimony of God's grace. That's a testimony of your own pride. The roaring lion will get you. He'll try to gobble you up. You can get good religion, and he'll let your boss curse you out in just a few days. But my blessed God, that boss is not who we're working for. We're just with him a few days. We're working for that eternal reward. Blessed be God. And all of these things really don't count down here, friend. It's what happens after a while that counts. This booger man, this Satan and his crowd... They've accused God to man in the garden with Adam and Eve. They said, God is doing you wrong. And they've accused man to God. They said, old Job won't serve you. 
And they've accused man to man. Job's comforter said, you sin. And they have thwarted the plan of God every place they could. And they even resist the minister. I, my Lord. Why don't you folks help anybody that gets up to preach or teach? A lot of folks will sit there and soak and sour, talk and gossip, pass notes, sleep and doze, look through a songbook, and a man of God or somebody up there trying to break the bread of life and get you to heaven. In Zechariah 3, 1, he said, I saw Joshua, the high priest, standing to minister, and Satan at his right hand to resist him. Did you hear what I said? I want you to know the devil doesn't want this word to go forth, and he's going to do everything he can to stop it. And if he can hinder it through your indifference and unconcern, he'll use you. I had somebody say to me the other day, he said, You've helped these preachers in this camp meeting. You help them preach. I'll help them preach any time a man gets up. I'm not egotistical enough to think I'm the only preacher around. And I might as well sop this one real good while I've got the bun and the gravy all together. A preacher that'll sit there like a knot on a log when somebody else is preaching has no right to ever ask anybody to say amen or try to get them to raise their hands when he's preaching. It's ego. You think, I'm the only one around and I hope you fail, sir. That's the attitude. I know some of us are reserved. Some of us are very quiet and we have to work at saying anything. But every now and then you could raise your eyebrow. One fellow in this meeting told me, I said, you haven't helped me a lick. He said, I crossed my legs one day. <laughs> but Satan hates the Word of God. And he's tried to accuse God to man and man to God and man to man and hinder the work of God even in the pulpit, in the priesthood. He's tried to hinder it. And he's done everything to pervert it and turn away from the plan of God. But he and all his crowd will wind up in perdition. Perdition means eternal, utter ruin and loss. But the plan of God and the people of God will have eternal perpetuation. That means not ending, continuing on and on and on. I've talked a lot about this church this week. And I've talked a lot about the contention for the faith and how things are happening and how we must stand in these last days. I have some members here this morning and they know what I'm saying. I'll tell you one thing. We have some things in our places that we may not can change, but it doesn't mean we have to open the door for anything else. Did you hear what I said? Don't add fuel to the fire. Get the door back to and close everybody up in there that's in there and try to get a revival going with that crowd that's in there. Don't let anybody else in that's not going to do right. Amen? You say, Brother Atkinson, it's been, you've uh, said some things that would make us despair about the hypocrites and the apostates. And that's all Jude talked about. He wasn't talking about anybody else coming in. He was talking about folks in our ranks entering in unawares without a lot of notice, not telling their intentions, tearing the faith of God apart and drawing away disciples. And they've come. But the great God of glory is not going to let this church suffer violence. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, part of the outline for yesterday, he said, Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and shun profane and vain babblings, uh, such as Hymenaeus and uh, such as Alexander and Philetus. He said, for their word doth eat as a canker. And this word canker in the original Greek is gangrena, from which we get our term gangrene. I want you to understand, friend, this church 
is having some things come at it now that the devil's trying to inject into our circulation system, into our very bloodstream and live stream. It's more than an external thing. And I'm going to, dear God, let me tell you this morning, and I said it the other day as diplomatically as I could say it, and I hope you got my message. Put your band-aids down. Put your plasters down. Don't ever be guilty of running around with a handful of band-aids and plasters. You say, but old Brother Atkinson, I've got a big ball over here and this pimple over here and I need to put a little something on it to cover it up. All you'll do is cover it up. But if you'll get something in the bloodstream, if you'll get an antidote in the bloodstream, if you'll get an antibiotic in the bloodstream, and an old-time revival is the antidote, an old-time revival is the antibiotic, and if you'll get something in the circulation system, it'll clean up the balls and the pimples and the places on the outside. You don't heal cancer by putting a poultice on the outside. My blessed God, you've got to get inside. And we can't forget the outside. I'm not saying that. But we need to preach where it's coming from. You see, and I know whereof I speak. I went not long ago to Ware Shoals High School for three mornings. And if you don't believe they took me across the grill, I went at the invitation of the Ministerial Association, and they asked me some things. And I want you to know, when you quote Deuteronomy, it doesn't do a lot for them. That hit 40 pounds heavy right back there. I said, Deuteronomy doesn't do a lot for them. You know why? They'll tell you not to plant two kinds of seed in the same row in your garden. What you going to say to that? That's all in the same scripture. I'm coming. Praise God. It doesn't do a lot for them. They'll shoot that full of holes. But you see, we need to understand what the overall system of Satan is. Satan wants a uni government. One government. He wants a uni church. One church. He wants the Antichrist over the uni government, and he wants the false prophet over the uni church. One church. And he's breaking down barriers. He wants a uni world. He's breaking down national barriers. And he wants a unisex, a unit government, a unit church, a unit world of nationalities, and a unisex. He is breaking down the barriers between the sexes. God said he created them male and female. Distinctly, he made them separate. And he created the nations. That's one reason he came down at the Tower of Babel, to have the different nations. And he said to the church, come out from among them and be ye separate. He wants distinction. God is a God of distinctions. And I want you to understand he's getting men to look like women and women to look like men and act like each other. I was trying, Lord, God help me. And that's the reason it's wrong. That's the reason some of these things are wrong, because he is breaking down distinctions and lines of demarcation. You say, Brother Atkinson, you're on a hobby horse now. I know it. And I'll ride him till I get ready to get off. It's my ride, my horse. How long has it been since the words transsexual and bisexual and transvestite came into our vocabulary. Oh, yeah. They're trying to make the United States Air Force now accept unisex. Come on now. And the Methodist Church has just had a fight. They've just had a fuss because a crowd in the Methodist Church would not liberalize, liberalize their views on homosexuality. They say we ought to be preachers ought to be ordained just like anybody else. And they'll get on TV and say, I'm a transsexual. I'm as happy with a man as I am a woman. God didn't intend that. And that's the reason he's making men look like women and women look like men is because he's after breaking down the distinction between the sexes.
It's not so much how the cloth is put together. It's the ultimate goal behind all of it and the motive, friend. Did you hear me? And that's the danger. Satan could care less if you wear a pantsuit, lady. But he wants you to be a transsexual, a bisexual, and leave your husband and become a lesbian. Come on now. That's what he's after. I know I'm preaching plain, but this is the motive and the plot and the scheme of the devil. Amen. And it's upon us. And it'll come to the church of God. We'll have an attempt made to liberalize our views. We sure will. And it's all around us. And it's coming. He's breaking down every barrier. He can. But the church of God must stand for the distinctions that God has set out and God has set forth. We must stand, friend. You say, Brother Atkinson, things are getting in a mess. The church is going to go down. No, mine's going up. I don't know where yours is going, but mine's going up. I got real concerned when I was youth director of this state. I heard some things that tore me out of the frame. And this one would come along and say, Did you know they're doing so-and-so at headquarters? And did you know they're doing so-and-so in Mobile? And so-and-so over at Anderson, South Carolina? And they're doing so-and-so over at uh, North Carolina? And it just tear me up to where I couldn't preach. You know, I, I, and I went over there to that wholeness conference on the Georgia campground. And uh, I'd shared my views with Brother Leonard Carroll, and I told him I was upset. And he didn't know what to do about it. But I knelt at that altar, weighed bell, and I said, Now, God, I've given myself to this church. All I've got's in it. I don't have a thing. It all belongs to you and the church. And I've sold out lock, stock, and barrel. What's going to happen to me and what's going to happen to this church? I'm frustrated. I'm concerned. Is the devil going to take it over? Are Korah, Cain, and Balaam going to take it over? Is worldliness going to eat it up? And so help me, God, he smote me right on top of my head with the Holy Ghost. And he said, don't you remember what I told my disciples? Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, it's still my church, and I'm still God, and hell will not overrun it. Get up and shout about what I'm doing for you. And I stood up in that Georgia tabernacle and praised God, for this is his church. And he's got his hand on it, friend. If I'll do what I'm supposed to do, and you'll do what you're supposed to do, God will do what he's supposed to do. And it'll all work out. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, la la banta salime koya. Rosha bahaya. Woo-hoo. Does anybody feel him out there? Would you look somebody square in the eye and say, I believe God's got his hand on the church? <laughs> do you really believe it? not be able to get them up without pulling up some of the wheat, Brother Bias, but God knows how. Oh, dear God, he said in 2 Timothy, he said there are vessels of honor and dishonor in the house, but he said, God knoweth them that are his. <laughs> My Lord, I want you to understand gangrene cannot be survived without something in the blood system, and we no longer have the outward approach against us but it's the gangrene that's getting in the very bloodstream. You see, in the crash of uh, 1972 in Miami, that jumbo jet, there was a man 22 years old on there that lay in that swamp for hours. They got him up and took him to Miami Hospital, and he lived till January 2nd. You know what killed him? The plane crash didn't kill him. A jumbo jet falling like a, a, a ball of fire to the earth didn't kill him. He survived that crash, and that's a miracle, friend. But he couldn't survive gangrene. He took gangrene and died. Something inside of him got gangrene, and he died. And you hear me, we've survived the storms. We've survived the crashes that the devil has put us through, but we cannot stand gangrene. We've got to let the blood of Jesus Christ flow through us and over us. It's His blood that will keep us pure. It's the power of God that will keep us pure. His blood is the antidote and the antibiotic, and we must stay under the drippings of Calvary and let that precious flow cover us every day of our lives. Amen. 
Amen? Oh, we've had the storms. A storm doesn't hurt the church. A storm knocks off the rotten fruit, the dead limbs, and the loose leaves. And when the storm's over, that old cedar of Lebanon will rear its head up when the sun of righteousness shines on it. There have been times Satan thought he had this church, that it was about gone, and we bowed our heads, but what he didn't know is we were talking to God. And the Lord said, Stand up. The Son of Righteousness with healing in His wings is shining on you. Stand up, and its fruit will not, its fruit will come forth in due season, and its leaf will not wither. It's God's church. It's the planting of the Lord. It's God's tree in His vineyard, my friend, and He's going to take care of it. If you'll do what you're supposed to do, I'll guarantee you God. God will do what He's supposed to do, and it'll work out according to His holy will. Why don't you get up, O.V. Sewell? You want to. Anybody else feel like jumping up and saying glory and sitting down? Praise God. Anybody feel like jumping up and saying hallelujah and sitting down? Oh, I know some folks that belong to God, and I know some that belong to the devil, and some I haven't decided. I'm still trying to figure them out. You know, the Bible said, by their fruits you'll know them. And I've said, I'm not a judge, but I'm a fruit inspector, but I'll guarantee you they've come out with a new variety in the last few days that I don't know something about. And I'm going to have to check with God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the Lord knoweth them that are His. And this is the reason the foundation will stand sure, according to 2 Timothy 2. You see, O.V. Sewell told me something when I was youth director here. He said, a man up at Crumley's Chapel told him. He said, do you know how to get a cow to accept another calf that's not hers, and you can put two calves on the same cow? I said, no. He said, that man said, take that calf away from that mother cow and put him over with the other calf and get you some vanilla flavoring and rub on the backs of both calves and turn them back into that cow and she'll go over and smell of one and say moo and smell of the other and say moo and she'll think she had twins <laughs> come on here now God's not a dumb cow I said God's not a dumb cow we've let the vanilla flavoring fool us but God knows what's vanilla flavoring and what's the blood of Jesus my blessed God and the world and hypocrites and the people creeping in under work and smear their vanilla flavoring of professionalism and profession in God and profession in the name of Jesus. They can smear it on all they want to, but the Lord knoweth them that are His. He's not deceived. He's not fooled. And when that great judgment day comes, He'll know who should be on the right and who should be on the left. And when that trumpet sounds and that rapture occurs, He'll know who's supposed to get out of the ground and who's supposed to stay in the ground. And He'll know who's supposed to leave here and who's supposed to stay here. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Oh, hallelujah. I want to run, but I don't have time. I wish five people would get up and run ten steps for me and sit down. That's not but two. Where are the other three? My blessed God. Anybody else run ten steps for me right quick? My God. He <laughs> Praise His holy name. God's not a vanilla flavor in God. That's as crude as it can be and as country as it can be, but it's so. You let old Ahab put on his other garments, the garments of a common soldier, and get in a common soldier's chariot and go out to battle and say, I've gotten by with it. That old man of God said the dogs would eat my flesh, or lick my blood, rather, and eat the flesh of Jezebel. They won't know who's in what chariot. 
do you know what the book said? Do you know what the book said? What did it say, Brother Bell? Arrow by chance. An arrow. He said a, a, a soldier by chance drew his bow. Come on now. He, he knew he just supposed to shoot, and he didn't have it on anything. He wasn't shooting at anything. He just said, well, the commander-in-chief said, get out here and fight, and here goes. I'm going to turn one loose so they think I'm doing my part. And by chance, he just turned it loose. But the Holy Ghost of God could see under the armor. The Holy Ghost of God could see behind that garb Ahab had on. And the Holy Spirit of God took that loose arrow and plunged it right to his body. My blessed God. And he died like the Word of God said. I want you to understand this world's not fooling God. Hypocrites aren't fooling God. The devil's not getting away with a thing. God's got his hand on the arrow. And the arrow of judgment and the arrow of God's wrath will fall upon this sinful society. It's going to work out, friend. What God said will come to pass. If God said it, you can count on it. Hallelujah. Woo-hoo! Glory. It's going to work out. And he's going to have a separation. There's going to be the judgment of the rapture. And the rapture is a judgment. Oh, yeah, it's a judgment. Oh, yeah. If the trumpet were to sound this morning, a judgment would occur in this tabernacle. How many know? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. You're ready and you wouldn't have to pray again. Apologize to anybody or God if the trumpet were to sound now. You see, everybody doesn't have his hand up. And that was a judgment right there. Amen? We are now ready for the rapture. No more scriptures have to be fulfilled. Not one more jot or tittle. No more signs have to be fulfilled. Right, right out here. Right in this section. Somebody said, The gospel has to be preached in all the world. For a witness to all nations, and then shall come the end. That's not talking about the rapture, rapture, lady. That's talking about the final act. And if you believe that's talking about the rapture, let me knock the blocks from under you with one or two little verses of Scripture. In Acts chapter 2, verse 5, it said, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, and they heard them speak. Colossians 1.23 and be not moved from the gospel, the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature under heaven. Which was preached to every creature under heaven. So if you're waiting for the gospel to get around, friend, you better get ready. <laughs> Brother McSwain? They don't believe what I quoted. I, I just quoted Scripture. I didn't say anything. If it hadn't been preached to every creature, then Paul lied. I didn't lie. Oh, I know there's an interpretation. And you could be wrong. But we're ready for the rapture. The rapture is going to occur any moment now. And when it occurs... The saints of God, the saints of the living God, the pure through the blood of Jesus, and those touched with holy fire. I might as well throw in one more controversial point before I leave. You've been asked the question over and over, do you have to have the Holy Ghost to go in the rapture? If you're not sick in him, you're not going, friend. I said, if you're not sick in the Holy Ghost, you can forget it. You're a lukewarm layout of sea, and you make him sick, and he'll vomit you up. Spew you out of his body. 
and I want to drive up one more peg right there. While I'm driving, I've heard folks say everybody that's in Christ is going in the rapture. Are they? I'm not telling you, I'm asking you. I want to give you a scripture to chew on. He said the Laodiceans, because you're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And the Greek terminology is vomit you up. And anything you vomit up is not in your mouth. You spit that out. But the Greek term is a mayo, vomit up from in his body. Did you hear what I said? We have said, I'm in Christ, but I don't feel the need for the Holy Spirit. You won't go in the rapture, friend. I don't know whether your preacher will tell you that or not, but this one will. If you are just saved and satisfied, you can forget the rapture. If you are not striving to please God and let His fullness come into your life, you can forget the rapture. If you're not seeking God with all your heart and dedicated to Him, you're not going in the rapture. And I don't care if you have gotten mad and ran your preacher off when he preached that from the pulpit just because you're too lazy and have too much pride to get an altar to seek the Holy Ghost. It doesn't change the Word of God. The Word of God says, If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit which dwelleth in you. I wanted you to chew on that before I left. I did not say you had to have the Holy Ghost to go in the rapture. See me outside. I'll say this. If a fellow gets saved tonight, Brother Lamar Vest preaches, and the rapture takes place, he'd probably go. But a Church of God boss has been sitting around on the pews for 15 years, and you've got too much pride to go to the altar because you think folks will think something's wrong with you. There is something wrong with you if you don't have the Holy Ghost after 15 years. <laughs> Besides, you may have to open my car door for me this morning. I said something like that one night up in Albertville, and a lady got mad at me and said, I'm going to my pastor and resign my Sunday school class. And that's what she should have done if she wasn't going to receive the Holy Ghost. And she got mad while I was preaching, and the preachers got quiet. And when I gave the altar call, the Holy Ghost said, Why don't you just go up to the altar and receive me? She said, Well, that won't do any harm. And she got under conviction and came to that altar and received the Holy Ghost and apologized to me and told that congregation. So I got mad. But said, He told me the truth, and I'm full of the Holy Ghost now, and I can hardly wait to get in my class in the morning. Praise God. Amen. And I don't know who's out here, Brother Thomas, but there are several folks out here that have been trying to run God's church and they can't run their own life to the altar and can't run their own life into dedication and can't run their own life into consecration enough and obedience enough to get the Holy Ghost. And if you can't run your own life into submission, quit trying to run God's church. Why, when they chose table servers, errand boys, deacons, and that's what a deacon is, an errand boy. That's what the Scripture said, diakonos, errand boy, one who executes the commands of another. You do what somebody else says. When they chose deacons, errand boys, they had to be full of the Holy Ghost. Had to be full of the Holy Ghost had to have an honest report and full of wisdom. That meant everything had to be up to par. He didn't grumble about anything, didn't fuss, didn't find fault. He made constructive suggestions, but he didn't fuss and try to run things. He didn't have an old haughty attitude. He paid his tithes. He came to church. He prayed in the altar. He did his best to get somebody to God every week. He had an honest report. Full of wisdom and full of the Holy Ghost. And you've got to be 
touched with holy fire on your way to receiving him in the next little bit are full of him to go in the rapture. Did you hear what I said? Sitting around satisfied, you're going to miss the rapture, friend. The rapture is going to occur, and for seven years we'll be in the third heaven, paradise of God, rewards rejoicing, all the holy angels, the saints of God. My Lord, what a time. On earth there'll be tribulation, antichrist, false prophet, mark of the beast, islands dropping in the sea, mountains crumbling, water turned to blood, men trying to die for five months and can't die, and into that Armageddon. At the end of the seven years, the Lord himself, Enoch said, with ten thousands, myriads and myriads of saints will return to this earth to execute judgment. You talk about the wholeness church is getting recognized now. You wait till that millennial reign when the Lord himself comes and an angel from heaven binds old Lucifer and puts him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and puts a seal upon him and shuts him up. Revelation 20 and 3 said, set a seal upon him and shut him up. I preach don't shut him up. My blessed God, he yaks, yaks, yaks and runs his mouth and gets all his little buddies to run their mouths and he'll criticize you and make you feel intimidated but there's coming a day my blessed God when he's put in that pit and a seal is set upon him nothing can get out and nothing can get in and he'll be shut up for a thousand years and we can have a wholeness meeting on any street corner and he won't be there to bother us <laughs> praise God hallelujah amen that word seals like making preserves. Nothing can get out and nothing can get in. Not a grunt for a thousand years. And during that thousand years, glorified saints of God will rule over flesh and blood people. Don't do that to me. They're going to be flesh and blood people. Everybody on earth during the millennial reign will not be glorified. Saints of God will not rule with a rod of iron over a glorified saint of God. We've got to have somebody else to rule over. The sheep nations will go into the millennial reign. Those that befriended Israel. And we'll rule over them for a thousand years. And Jesus Christ will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And at the close of that thousand years, a great white throne judgment will occur. And the sea and hell and death shall give up the dead in them and they shall stand before God saints of God will not be judged at the white throne judgment only the wicked men all the way back to creation will stand there and they shall give an account the people that have gone to hell will come out of hell and they shall stand before him and every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things beneath the earth they will confess that he's Jesus Christ they won't have a chance to be saved they won't have a chance to accept him but they'll have to admit that he's Jesus Christ you hear what I'm saying this morning every man or woman that's ever been born will one time someplace have to admit that he's Jesus Christ voluntarily or involuntarily and I've already admitted that I'm not ashamed of it I've already been to judgment bar of God and I pled guilty and God gave me a pardon and washed my sins away and I'm shouting his praises if you haven't been to the judgment bar you will one day admit that he's Jesus Christ the Lord of lords and king of kings <laughs> oh <laughs> praise God and when the white throne judgment is completed he's going to burn this earth with fire and the heavens, the first and second heavens, with fire where Satan's been and where evil's been. And he's going to give us a new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness forever. No taint of sin, no trace of the devil, no trace of evil, but one eternal holiness praise service forever and ever with the saints of the living God. God's going to stop this contention. God's going to wipe out the opposition. And there will come a day when we can worship God and serve God just like we want to without having to fight it'll be a feast all the time and never a fight I'm teaching this morning y'all don't feel anything Satan will be put in the bottomless pit at the beginning of the millennial reign, let out for a little season at the end to tempt the flesh and blood folks that were born during the millennial reign. Then he'll be put in the lake of fire. 
forever and ever where the beast and the false prophet are. They've been there a thousand years waiting on him. They will be cast alive in the lake of fire. Praise God. Man, you see, that's the last chapter I read. <laughs> and that's what makes me walk through the trials and the troubles and the problems. My Lord, let's have another testimony meeting. Would you just reach over and catch hands with somebody, shake hands with somebody and say, I'm ready for the rapture. Praise God. You're not excited about it? It doesn't mean anything to you? Tell one more person. Tell another person you're ready for the rapture. Praise God. Oh, my blessed God. Everybody that's ready for the rapture, raise both hands and praise Him with all your heart and all your soul. Praise His holy name. Blessed be God. Hallelujah. He's touching somebody right now. He's picking somebody up in the spirit right now. Somebody that's been discouraged. Somebody that's been disappointed is getting a lift in life by the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, weary pilgrim, walk on a few more days. The next step could be the last. My God, just a few more hours and we'll be going home. Hallelujah. Let's omit that song. What time is it, Brother Thomas? I want us to sing one verse. Our Lord's coming back to earth again. I don't want anybody to leave. It's disrespectful to me for you to leave. But I want us to sing one verse, that theme song. Our Lord's coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no tempter then. Remember the outlines? After the song, Brother Kenneth Dismukes may want to say something, but they'll be over here. I love you. God bless you. I'm going to glory. Going to pull out most any time now. How many of you are going to glory? How many determined not to let the devil get you? Amen. Praise.